Justin Darden is one of the largest leading Middle East energy experts. He has worked as a, an energy and Middle East scholar at the University of Oxford, as a, Saud, as a Saudi Aramco fellow, and as a Fulbright scholar in the Middle East and North Africa. Formerly, Mr. Dargan was a research fellow with the Dubai Initiative at Harvard University, where he won a Harvard Award for his research on the region. Mr. Dargan is a specialist in international energy law, and he has written extensively on carbon trading, the global oil and gas market, the legal framework surrounding the Gulf energy sector, regional industrialization, and Middle Eastern geopolitics. Our moderator today is Dr. Paul Salem. Dr. Salem is the Vice President of Policy and Research at the Middle East Institute, where he is the leading an initiative on Arab transitions. He previously served as Director of the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut, Lebanon. Dr. Salem was previously the General Director of the Ferris Foundation and prior to that founded and directed the Lebanese Center for Policy Studies, Lebanon's leading public policy thinker. Dr. Salem is the author of a number of books, articles on the Middle East, and is also a frequent television and radio commentator on issues relating to the Middle East and the Arab world. Our panelists' discussion today will be followed by a Q&A session moderated by Dr. Salem, who will kick off uh, the session with a few questions and then follow that with open it for the rest of our guests. With that said, I would like to ask you all to join me in welcoming our distinguished guests. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rami, uh, and I want to salute the Tahrir Institute, which has really brought an uh, excellent new voice, an uh, Arab voice, an Egyptian voice, to uh, policy making and policy, policy discussions here in Washington. Uh, we are all eager to hear from our two excellent panelists, and I'm to introduce them, uh, all concerned about uh, the developments in Egypt, uh, and are all aware of the importance of economics in terms of jobs and uh, and, and prosperity and growth and how that can ease some of the crises of the population there. So as uh, Rami mentioned, our panelists uh, will start with an uh, opening statement perhaps uh, from the podium. I think Justin uh, will go first and uh, talk a bit about uh, energy uh, and issues related to that and then followed uh, by a presentation by, by um, the economic situation. So Justin, please. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, uh, both Paul and uh, Rami. And uh, also, I appreciate all of you braving this uh, tumultuous uh, weather to, to hear us speak. So we hope that uh, we can create the type of vibrant and interactive session for all of you. So we're quite appreciative. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, I'm going to speak about energy issues in Egypt and how energy is connected with the current social political unrest uh, in the country. And really, we have to understand that energy is key. So without a resolution of the energy situation within Egypt, you really can't resolve many of the other issues which are percolating at the moment. So if we consider Egypt, Egypt is known as Umadunya, as most of us know, mother of the world. And Egypt, of course, was the center of uh, the ancient world uh, for a long time. In addition to that, even though Syria was the midwife, Arab was really the mother of also uh, Pan-Arabism, or Aruba, uh, during, that, uh, during the time period of the 50s and 60s, late 50s, 60s, and even to a certain degree in the early 70s or what have you. So Egypt is essential to regional security. Indeed, I would say security throughout the entire MENA region. Now, I don't want to go through uh, the entire litany of problems that Egypt is facing at the moment, I mean, because we know that uh, they're quite significant. But we do know, uh, since the downfall of the former president, uh, Hazrat Mubarak, in early 2011, uh, Egypt has experienced significant problems, of course, with uh, foreign revenue which has declined uh, quite uh, significantly. Uh, Egypt has also faced problems with uh, trying to regain uh, the critical uh, tourism uh, revenue, which uh, really has not reached the levels, the pre-revolution uh, levels. In addition to that, uh, Egypt uh, was on a precipice of economic collapse, but for the grace of its uh, GCC patrons, which have assisted Egypt uh, immensely. I mean, so, of course, this list is uh, not exhausted, but I mean, it's just as some of the severe challenges that Egypt is facing. But nonetheless, Egypt has quite recently uh, undertaken some steps to attempt to revitalize its energy sector. And, and I think that these are steps in the right direction, uh, even though these steps are not necessarily um, final steps, whereby they can absolutely solve all the problems. But I think that at least it indicates that there is some will 
on the part of those in authority that something must be done in order to solve these crippling, crippling energy shortages and the natural gas deficits and what have you. But we still have to consider one thing, though. Despite these steps, from the short to midterm, Egypt is still going to have significant problems in the energy sector, and it's still going to experience blackouts, and the blackouts are actually increasing year on year, and it's still going to experience a natural gas deficits. But I think that eventually these problems will be resolved. But from the short to midterm, no matter the steps that are undertaken at the moment, Egypt is still going to have quite significant problems. So to put it in context, Egypt is facing a strategic dilemma. And what the strategic dilemma is, is whether Egypt should meet its domestic energy consumption, or demand, rather, uh, which is obviously concerned mostly with hydrocarbons, so oil and natural gas, which thereby lead into power demand, or whether it wants to focus on export of energy to the international market, international market prices, which, of course, is a crucial hard currency generator for Egyptian economy. So that's the st strategic dilemma that Egypt is facing at the moment and what is to be done. However, before I go into that, I would like to discuss the timeline of the problems. So contrary to uh, conventional wisdom, the problems that Egypt is facing in terms of its energy and power sector is not the result of the revolution uh, that occurred in 2011. No, uh, these problems actually were derived from a political decision, indeed many political decisions that were undertaken in the late 1990s. And these political decisions that were made were meant to privilege natural gas production and consumption at the expense of oil consumption. Now, why is that? Well, we have to look at it holistically. Uh, Egypt, as many MENA countries, considered itself to be an oil country. Okay, so what I mean by an oil country, an oil producing country, even though it's not as significant as other countries in the region, but still, oil was the mainstay of Egypt's energy policy. Natural gas for Egypt, and as many other MENA countries, uh, was viewed as being an unfortunate byproduct. Uh, indeed, uh, it, it was uh, unlucky to be able to find significant reserves of natural gas when you were looking for oil. So what many of the countries in the region did, not only Egypt, but also in the Gulf region, they just flared the gas uh, because uh, they actually saw no use for that. And then there was a change. A change occurred, uh, we could even say psychologically. And this change occurred, uh, we could first see the beginnings of these changes, which occurred in the early 1980s, late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, mostly in the Gulf region with Saudi Arabia in the beginning and also many of the other Gulf countries. And then it also spread to Egypt as well in the 1990s. Um, and this sea change, sea change basically was that we can use a natural gas molecule as the impetus for economic development in our countries. So, so the bedrock of industrialization, economic modernization, is going to be based on natural gas molecule. Now, how did this psychological evolution, you could say, how did this occur? Well, it occurred because of several factors. Uh, one factor, we have um, immense economic expansion and demographic growth uh, in Egypt uh, during 1990s. And uh, we also had, um, due to certain economic reforms, even though it wasn't necessarily trickle-down economics, you could say, but nonetheless, I mean, there were uh, there was an increase in, in terms of the middle class, and people had much more disposable income uh, that uh, they could uh, use. So, of course, uh, there was an increase in energy consumption. And then, in addition to that, uh, we also had um, expansion of educational opportunities uh, in Egypt. Now, these policies, of course, derive from Gamal Abdel Nasser, who uh, promised every Egyptian graduate uh, would have a job and what have you, although most of those jobs obviously were the bureaucracy, so that caused its own problems. Nonetheless, when you had an expansion of educational opportunities, it meant that you have to find jobs for people as well. So job creation was also key for the Egyptian authorities because you had demographic growth and then you had more graduates. And also you had to a certain degree more women entering into the workforce as well, which expanded the workforce, which, which, which was a driver for uh, increased uh, job creation, which was needed uh, for the populace. And then thirdly, uh, you also had uh, the requirements for economic diversification. Uh, so Egypt no longer wanted to remain a country which only exported uh, unprocessed natural resources. <laughs> Egypt wanted to create what we could say a modern economy, a modern industrial economy, which uh, would have backward and forward linkages uh, throughout the national economy and uh, through the creation of a value-added industrial sector. 
So basically, uh, manufacturing would be taking place in Egypt or what have you. And the idea was that natural gas could be the primary driver for that goal. And then lastly, we had um, the idea, and of course, all of these are inter interrelated. We must not forget that. So we had uh, the issue of um, the desire to increase oil revenue through exports. So if you recall, Egyptian oil production peaked in 1993. We had an increase as well uh, in oil consumption. And of course, there's a domestic pricing policy within Egypt whereby uh, uh, most energy uh, inputs are sold at below the cost of production. So basically, Egypt had a choice, whether it was going to consume the lion's share, which was increasing year on year, of its oil production um, domestically, and uh, it basically faced a very large opportunity cost, or should it export to international market? Rate. So the idea was to export to international market, which of course would increase uh, foreign revenue. So those are the main reasons why Egypt moved or transitioned to uh, trying to focus on increasing natural gas production and consumption. And that was considered to be the solution, uh, the answer uh, for the Egyptian policymakers at that time for all of their uh, problems. So uh, since the natural gas policy was implemented, and again, this is the mid to late uh, 1990s, um, Egypt in tandem with economic reforms that were also instituted uh, during the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s by uh, the former president, Hazim Barak, uh, was able to secure significant uh, foreign investment and also uh, do this significant foreign investment in the energy sector, uh, also made some significant natural gas buys as well. So uh, Egypt was, uh, as they say, uh, sitting pretty in the late 1990s and early 2000s in terms of its natural gas uh, position. But uh, what went wrong? Well, we could say that again because of the political decision that was made. You have to look at how Egypt decided to utilize the gas. So the way that Egypt decided to utilize the gas was rapid expansion of the downstream natural gas industries. And of course, we all know what that is. Uh, the natural gas, uh, the downstream natural gas industries, of course, are um, petrochemicals, fertilizers, or what have you. And then also the energy intensive industries. So these are industries that consume uh, significant amounts of, of energy in order to uh, drive forth their production. So in Egypt, it tends to be the cement industry. So Egypt made a, a strategic focus to develop these industries. And of course, even though they're capital intensive, the idea was that uh, you could form other industries that would have the spillover effect and you would create a type of dynamic environment. And Egypt had the population uh, to, to foster a type of increase in domestic demand as well. So the idea was that you could have a self-sustaining uh, economy based on a natural gas molecule that would have a spillover effect in other economic sectors as well. Um, and then secondly, uh, there was a major switchover uh, from the consumption of oil in the power sector to the consumption of natural gas. Uh, so uh, now Egypt generates the majority of its uh, power generation uh, from natural gas as opposed to uh, oil. So that's another key factor. And then lastly, uh, Egypt uh, engaged in a rapid, uh, the rapid expansion of uh, natural gas exports. So we have uh, uh, the two main LNG, or actually the two only LNG plants, uh, which were which were uh, constructed uh, during that time, and also a major pipeline projects and what have you, expansion of pipeline projects uh, during that uh, time period. So the gas consumption increased precipitously because of these political decisions that were made in order to privilege natural gas consumption. However, we can see that around 2006, 2007, that's when the cracks appeared in the facade of what should have been a very a good time for the Egyptian economy. And uh, we could see that at uh, the beginning of, of, of deficits, uh, uh, natural gas deficits, and rapidly increasing uh, natural gas and power consumption that were starting to reach production. So it started to happen around 2006, 2007. In 2008, that's where we have the first major realization by the Egyptian authorities that we are facing, um, in the future, uh, uh, gas, major gas shortages. <coughs> Pardon me. So in 2008, there was a decision that was made uh, to launch a moratorium on further uh, gas exports, uh, LNG exports in particular. And also 2008 was the time of the first blackout in Egypt, it was in 2008. Now, of course, what happened, these blackouts, even though 2008 was the beginning of this period of blackouts, it started to expand, it started to intensify year on year. So first it happened maybe for about a week during the peak demand period. Uh, uh, 
uh, which is during the summer, of course, when it's quite hot and air conditioning use is, is quite high and so on. And then year on year, it starts to expand. And then uh, in 2012, no longer was it confined merely to um, the peak demand period, which was during the summer. Then we began to see blackouts during the winter period, which should not have occurred. And from 2012 onward, the blackouts again uh, during winter began to increase as well. Uh, so Egypt uh, was, and some would argue perhaps is, still heading towards a period of having year-round year blackouts and, and brownouts. And again, I, I want to reiterate that this really was due to political decisions that were made. Now, perhaps some things could have been done differently, but the Arab Spring is not the fault. Or, or I can say that the Arab Spring was not the driver, perhaps, of these uh, energy issues. Perhaps at most we can argue that the Arab Spring exacerbated the basic structural problems that the Egyptian economy and the Egyptian energy sector was facing, only exacerbated it. But Egypt was still well in its way towards uh, facing uh, many of these uh, uh, problems in its energy uh, sector. And um, I would like to just briefly go into uh, what are some potential steps that Egypt could undertake in order to resolve some of its um, basic uh, uh, energy uh, issues. First and foremost, what Egypt should do is um, engage in comprehensive price, pricing reformation. And, and I think that's first and foremost. So Egypt needs to revise its natural gas and power uh, pricing stru uh, structure. And that's really the only way that Egypt would go forward. And Egypt would be able to um, lower consumption. And, and, and we have to understand what does it mean by pricing? Why do you want to increase prices? Okay, we want to increase prices for two reasons. One is that natural gas uh, pricing at the moment in Egypt is below the cost of production. That's one thing. So you want to be able to increase prices at the very least to meet the cost of production. That's number one. Then number two, you want to telegraph to the market that you need to lower your consumption. So yes, of course, you can uh, try to encourage the populace, and, and this goes for any country in the world. You can engage in conservation campaigns. But what really works is if you, um, how can I say, communicate uh, to uh, the consumers through their pocketbooks that um, you need to lower consumption. The best way to do so is simply through increasing prices. And of course, you're going to see a drop in consumption the very next day if you do so. So those are really you know, uh, two reasons why you want to increase uh, prices. And then uh, two, you want to engage in energy efficiency. And then there's a push-pull dynamic with energy efficiency, so that's what we have to remember. In terms of the push dynamic with energy efficiency, um, campaigns perhaps or, 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 or initiatives, is that you create a type of um, governmental program. And the governmental program, and such as we have in the United States, uh, which is uh, best available technology. Right? So you want to create certain standards that indicate that, uh, let's say, certain industrial equipment has to run at a certain level of efficiency, uh, air conditioners. And it, actually, this is a, a major driver in Egypt because in the early to mid-2000s, you had an influx of very cheap, and I mean cheap in the classical sense of the word, I mean low quality, not just inexpensive, but you had uh, quite uh, cheap Chinese made uh, air conditioners that were showing up and, and very inefficient. So uh, it consumed a lot of uh, uh, electricity to run. And then in addition to that, uh, you had, um, many Egyptians have more disposable income, so they're able to purchase these inexpensive and cheap uh, air conditioners, which are uh, hailed from uh, China. So what you want to do is you want to uh, create a type of um, energy efficiency um, uh, regulation that would uh, basically mandate that we're not going to have air conditioners running at uh, at a certain level of uh, energy consumption or what have you, or power consumption. And uh, countries such as Thailand uh, has had um, uh, quite a successful run and lowered its uh, power consumption significantly by creating uh, basically energy efficiency mandates for, for air conditioners. So, so, so this is something very impo important when you uh, try to create a type of push dynamic. Now in terms of a pull dynamic, a pull dynamic encompasses two factors. A pull dynamic is one, a conservation campaign, and it's not entirely useless. Conservation campaigns do work, and we can see that it's worked in the U.S., it's worked in Europe and in other countries. So, uh, so that's one thing that we need to consider, and also pricing as well. So when you increase the price of electricity, that also acts as a pull because then consumers want to purchase more energy efficient uh, uh, air conditioners and also other household appliances uh, because they're going to basically consume less power and thereby their power bills would be less as well. So that is um, 
aspect of the core dynamic. And then I would say lastly what you would also want to do is you want to renew or revise actually I would say or even um, revitalize if I would use that word the terms of investment uh, which um, which are uh, which are negotiated with the IOCs, the international oil companies that are operating in Egypt. So you want to create a type of incentive structure for the for the international oil companies that are operating within Egypt to make it attractive for them to be able to uh, produce indigenous uh, natural gas and yet at the same time supply that to the domestic market because the current framework, even though Egypt at the moment is in the process of negotiating with many oil companies, but um, you want to create this type of of, um, incentive structure because uh, previously it, it was really not working at least for the past several years it did work in the early 2000s but it's not it's no longer working simply because of the rise of, of domestic consumption and um, perhaps one last thing I, I, I could say is that um, Egypt for the foreseeable future is going to be an LNG importing country uh, for a foreseeable future uh, so we cannot deny that so there needs to be a type of recognition that LNG import is not only going to be a short-term fix, that it's actually ha it has to be part of a long-term plan to create a dynamic and flexible uh, energy mix uh, to meet Egypt's needs for the long term and also for job creation and what have you. And if you have any questions, uh, please bring them up uh, during uh, the Q&A. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Thank you very much, Justin. I have a few questions. Let me start with a few questions to Justin. Uh, and I'd like to ask a bit about the, sort of the foreign aspect of the oil and gas issue with Egypt. Uh, Egypt used to export gas to Israel, export through the Arab gas pipeline to some of the Arab countries. Now it's turning into a you know, gas importer, or will be increasingly so. There is a large eastern Mediterranean offshore gas sector that's emerging, Israel already very far advanced, uh, and potentials in, of Gaza and Lebanon on the Cyprus is moving as well. But big challenges about how to get that gas to the market, which market to get it to, whether to use LNG or to use pipelines. And Egypt has been mentioned on and off uh, in that discussion. Uh, Israel is becoming a gas exporter. Egypt might need gas if there some talk going on there. Uh, Egypt has LNG plans, Israel and others might need LNG plans. So my question is, uh, what could you tell us about Egypt's uh, energy, foreign interest, and foreign policy? That's a very good question. And uh, well, one thing that we have to do is that Egypt is uh, Egypt's neighbors to the United States. And much of the British, to the United States, reserves, and Israel. Uh, but Egypt's potential stake in terms of offshore uh, eastern Mediterranean uh, gas fields would perhaps just abut or overlap a bit with those off of Gaza, which actually is not that significant. So we have to look at Egypt in the context of importing uh, natural gas from perhaps its um, neighbors uh, from the eastern Mediterranean. And uh, as we know, uh, there was a non-binding MOU that was signed about two weeks ago uh, between uh, Union Finosa, which uh, of course uh, owns um, one of the LNG uh, plants uh, in Egypt, and, um, and uh, uh, the holders of, um, of uh, the Tamar field, actually. Uh, so we're dealing with Noble Energy and also Dunnick as well. And there is an MOU signed between them for uh, gas export uh, through pipeline. And of course, this was a non binding MOU the Tamar field uh, to uh, Egypt. Now, of course, this uh, is fraught with complications. I mean, so we do know that Egypt uh, was exporting uh, to Israel at below uh, market price, uh, LNG, for, for some uh, time period, and this has caused uh, significant problems uh, within uh, Egypt, and as a result, uh, the Egyptian authorities had canceled uh, this contract uh, with Israel because uh, the allegation was that uh, there was uh, a fair amount of uh, corruption uh, uh, that was um, uh, behind uh, this contract, and then also the geopolitical issues as well. Uh, so this contract was uh, canceled. Um, so importing gas from Israel, well, that's another issue, but uh, to, par to par uh, paraphrase uh, the, uh, what people normally say, uh, where there's a need, there's a way. And there's a significant uh, need within Egypt uh, to 
uh, obtain uh, natural gas. And, and I think that that could perhaps uh, be one of the ways to facilitate some type of at least code peace, if not reconciliation between uh, Egypt and Israel. And of course, uh, Egypt is not as antagonistic as the previous administration, or the current administration is not as antagonistic as the previous administration. And uh, just as an anecdote as well, um, Egypt has also offered uh, the Israeli authorities overflight of drones the Sinai Peninsula for coordinated effort against a certain, um, certain uh, militant activity. I mean, so that shows that there is Thank you. Uh, so that shows that there is uh, at least talk going on at some level between uh, these two sides. Now, what the Egyptian Ministry of Petroleum said in order for this contract to go forward, well, okay, first of all, it has to be approved by both countries, by Israel, of course, and by Egypt. Now, the Egyptian Authority said, the Ministry of Petroleum, is that uh, this contract can go forward uh, under two uh, preconditions, let's say. Uh, one, is that it must be shown uh, that this natural gas can add substantial value to the Egyptian economy. So that has to be proven, but I think that no one can really dispute that considering the natural gas prices uh, in Egypt uh, at the moment. And then secondly, uh, uh, Union Canosa, because of the um, diversion of natural gas from the LNG plant that Union Canosa had, uh, it must, well, well, when Egypt did that, Basic, uh, when Egypt diverted the natural gas from the uh, Unifrosa uh, LNG plant, uh, basically what Unifrosa did was it initiated uh, an arbitration suit for several billion dollars against uh, Egypt for lost sales and, and what have you. So the Egyptian Ministry of Petroleum said that this arbitration suit must also be halted as well. And if these two preconditions are met, then apparently this deal could go ahead. So I think that we, we must look at this context, Paul. I think that it's not so much what potential Egypt has in the eastern Mediterranean, even though it does have offshore fields that can receive more investment, and I think that they would be able to produce more and off the downward slide, but more of how Egypt is going to contribute to, let's say, regional natural gas development through the importation of natural gas. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. On the uh, uh, energy subsidies, which both of you talked, uh, talked about, and obviously are key at many levels, both for both the budget and for the economy and consumption and so on, Obviously, sort of moving from subsidized energy to more correctly priced energy is something many countries have gone through. What can you say from the experience of other countries, lessons learned, easier ways to do it, different impacts on different tranches of society, given that subsidies actually benefit the have more than the have now in bulk in terms of energy, the consumption of corporation vehicles and things like that, not necessarily the poor. But what, what are lessons learned? Well, that's absolutely correct. Well, I mean, one thing we recognize is that um, in a country such as Egypt with a significant amount of the populace, which is impoverished, uh, that the subsidies operate at a regressive level, a regressive, not progressive, as, um, as my colleague indicated uh, earlier. So it, it, it does not benefit the populace indicated uh, the poorest levels of society. Uh, so something has to be done about that. But across the region, there is a change in the air, we can perhaps say, and change in the air to the extent that most of the MENA energy-rich countries have some level of subsidization involved in the energy sector, some more so, others less so. But they are all confronting this issue with the exception of Qatar. So every single energy-rich MENA country is confronting the issue of reformation of the subsidization regime in terms of the energy sector. Um, I would look at Egypt, though. I wouldn't compare it to, let's say, its Gulf neighbor, because obviously it has a different issue. So, I mean, Saudi Arabia does have certain elements of poverty, of course, but I would actually compare it more to either Iran or to Indonesia. I think Indonesia is actually a better, a better uh, uh, example. And the reason I say it is because Indonesia, uh, years ago, engaged in a comprehensive uh, reformation of its energy subsidization regime. And, um, of course, Indonesia is an energy producing country. It's a developing country as well. And uh, Indonesia has uh, significant uh, social political unrest as well. So, I mean, I think that it, it has much more in common with Egypt than some of the other countries. Now, Indonesia was uh, fairly successful in the implementation of this reformation program because what it did was it focused on several key elements. And, and this is what the Egyptian authorities need to do if they're going to reform the energy cycle. These elements are, on one hand, education. So they didn't just announce some type of shock and awe economic 
program, which uh, from one day to the next, people wake up and they're confronted with a, a, a price which is triple or quadruple what they're used to. No, it gradually led up to uh, the, uh, to the uh, let's say, the understanding of the populace that there is going to be uh, some type of a change uh, coming soon in terms of energy prices, and this is why we need to do so. Because if we continue along this way, our, con our country's economy is going to collapse, or it's going to uh, face uh, significant difficulties, and, and we're going to consume much more of our energy patrimony and so on and so forth. So they engage in a comprehensive educational campaign, and I think that this is quite important to do. Um, secondly, it was phased in. So it wasn't just one broad movement or sharp movement to increase prices. No, it was set in phases with certain targets that were to be achieved. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and I also think this is important, as it allows the populace to become acclimated step by step to a new pricing reality. And to be honest, uh, prices act as a type of psychological understanding. I mean, so uh, you have to prepare the people to a certain degree, and you can't really uh, shock them because what this can do is can cause significant mm -hmm. Then, lastly, uh, what uh, the authorities did was um, they uh, more or less, um, because there's significant poverty in Indonesia, so what they did was they created targeted. A campaign. So those who were able to afford would have higher energy prices, uh, and those who were not able to afford as much of an increase would uh, be able to have uh, uh, prices which were less so, uh, so uh, which were less expensive. And um, the way they instituted this was through the creation of a targeted uh, energy uh, 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 subsidization reformation uh, campaign. And um, they had smart cards and things of that nature, and they were able to identify which uh, subsets of the populace would be able to afford what, what, or what. And um, because of this, Indonesia was relatively successful in stemming any type of uh, major uh, uh, social political unrest uh, from you know, the side of the, mm -hmm. the populace. Now, uh, it's not going to be easy for you to do so, but I would say that this tiered method of, of conducting this, and of course you need to have a strong administrative apparatus <coughs> excuse me, in order to do so, but I, I think that if Egypt were to undertake this type of policy, that it could be successful. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Justin. Keep your, keep your, keep on, your, hand, keep your hand up for the microphone. Uh, Please introduce yourself and ask a question. My name is Michael Alvin. I'm an independent researcher. Both of you have mentioned uh, the importance of education in Egypt, uh, in the development of the of the economy, it, w what has been the uh, impact of uh, the revolution since January of 2011 on the educational infrastructure? And is the uh, current infrastructure up to the job of creating the cadre of workers that you that you say the country needs? Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. Then we'll go back to him. Okay, Igor Silva, I'm an interested citizen. How much of the economy is controlled by the military and how this is going to deal with it? Laura Daniels from European Parliament. Um, you spoke briefly about the budget deficit. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate a bit on uh, retrenchment and the timeline for it and what the appropriate way to go about it would be during this particular socio-political context. I apologize for being that guy at a Washington event, but what should the U.S. do about it? Um, and specifically in terms of the way we uh, allot our aid to, uh, to Egypt. Uh, what should the U.S. do about, uh, you know, trying to stimulate the Asian economy, trying to encourage the sorts of um, programs that Angus was talking about? Um, you know, in terms of our economic aid, should we reshift our military aid towards more economic? I mean, these are all sorts of uh, discussions that we're having, and uh, would be interested in your thoughts on that. I'm curious to get your thoughts on what Egypt is doing to differentiate itself from other emerging markets writ large and other emerging markets uh, in the Middle East. 
because it seems to me that uh, their old value proposition of being a stable country with a good business climate, uh, with great uh, opportunities for tourism, other countries have those now, um, and so th th those rules no longer apply. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on what Egypt is doing to gain a competitive advantage over other countries in the region. All right. Uh, no further questions. So let's end this that with you. Comment to the microphone. Come in. Yes, well, what I'd like to do, I, there weren't uh, many energy-specific uh, questions, uh, and that's what we might focus on. Uh, what I would uh, like to answer, uh, the gentleman over there spoke about uh, the Egyptian military and uh, its role in the Egyptian economy. Um, well, I think uh, what President Sisi represents is a type of retrenchment, or not even just that, I, I think even expansion, a great expansion of the role of the military within the overall Egyptian Economy, and I think that goes uh, without saying. But uh, at the same time, though, even though uh, we tend to criticize this, we must understand that the military really is the only viable, is the only standing, the only respected, really, institution in Egypt at the moment. So if you want to get something done, for better or for worse, you do have to go to the military, and the military does have the connections, even though we do want to see the private sector take on a greater role and what have you. But uh, we definitely do see an expansion of the military within the overall Egyptian economy and even uh, within the energy sector. And, and I think that this um, has been an issue even because, for instance, at around 2012 or so, uh, there were uh, certain energy companies that wanted to get permits and uh, certain permits for exploration, what have you. And uh, these had to be, of course, obtained from the military, and uh, there were issues where the military was not granting permits uh, expeditiously, and, and, and so it led to delays and, and so on and so forth. Um, but in reality, uh, I, I would even say that perhaps the military was a bit more uh, quick or rapid with that than even the Ministry of Petroleum would be post-revolution. So this is the conundrum that uh, has to really be dealt with, but at least in the energy sector, we can see that uh, it has grown, and even in terms of uh, many of the, the Gulf patrons at the moment, uh, such as the UAE, which is investing uh, significantly in the Egyptian economy, uh, the UAE tends to want to deal with uh, army-linked uh, companies uh, um, because of uh, certain issues. And it, it, it seems that uh, the prevalent view is that uh, the private sector is a bit more rife uh, with uh, corruption and may not be up to the task uh, for some of the major projects which are envisioned. I'm not saying that this is accurate, but it seems that this uh, seems to be the view emanating from uh, certain uh, sectors uh, within uh, uh, within the Gulf or what have you that are thinking about investing uh, to at least uh, a certain uh, extent. Uh, in terms of uh, education, um, I was speaking more about instrumental uh, education. So I wasn't speaking about education uh, as a whole. Uh, so in terms of education, uh, there needs to be an educational campaign uh, which is focused on uh, trying to create an awareness within the Egyptian populace as to the need of uh, conserving electricity, conserving power, and, and what have you, and more or less a type of, um, a, a type of uh, environmental or ecological awareness of the impact of their energy use, at least on the country and on the overall uh, energy uh, position of Egypt. So it was more of an instrumental sense, and Egypt really hasn't had that before. Uh, in terms of uh, having some type of detailed uh, educational campaign in order to inspire a type of ecological awareness within the populace. Uh, but I think that there is scope for this now uh, due to, as, uh, as Angus uh, mentioned earlier, due to the impact of the young people within Egypt and due to hope in the air, uh, notwithstanding the previous, of uh, course, uh, you know, situation in Egypt where it looked like despair, but I think that the young people obviously uh, would have a role to play in trying to create this type of awareness, which would go a long way in terms of uh, lowering uh, energy uh, consumption. So uh, to that extent, uh, that's where I think education will play a role in the instrumental sense. Uh, of course, now broad-based education is important, but um, what I referred to there was a very specific application of an educational campaign. Uh, so, so I think that that would be quite important. Um, now, in terms of uh, shifting uh, U.S. Uh, focus uh, in Egypt, well, I think that uh, there is the perception 
and of course his perception is um, across the region and I don't necessarily think it is accurate but nonetheless it is the perception uh, that uh, perhaps the US was a bit uh, too friendly with, uh, with uh, the Brotherhood and what have you. This is a perception unfortunately uh, in some quarters uh, and, and I think we must do much to dispel uh, this um, perhaps uh, misplaced and ill-informed uh, notion. Uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, in certain countries in the region, that was the idea. Uh, so I think that now uh, we must realize uh, that uh, CC is here to stay and that CC is perhaps the most viable uh, leader that uh, Egypt has had uh, in a long time. And we need to support him uh, in his quest. So I think that we need to come out strongly and support CC. And I think also uh, through support of CC, we can help him with some of the tough decisions that need to be made in terms of economic reformation. And CC, I think, is quite serious about economic reformation. He's quite serious about this because the challenges are quite extreme. And to focus on the energy sector, uh, within, I would say, the next few months, uh, we're going to see uh, some bold statements made about, uh, about uh, reforming the energy price uh, in Egypt and how to go ahead with that. And I can say it's just within the next few months. So I think that as um, what the U.S. could do is take the, bulls, take the bull by the horn and help assist CC in that, perhaps with uh, you know advice, uh, perhaps with, I mean, Egypt doesn't need IMF help at the moment because it has golf assistance, but nonetheless, I think using uh, inst uh, international institutions as well as the support of the U.S., I think that this could help him stabilize his position, thereby Egypt could undertake a much more harmonious transformation. And then you can, uh, you can ambush them as you try to say. But uh, again, I want to thank the Tahrir Institute, Rami, Nancy, Alice, and the whole team for bringing these excellent two panelists. I found it extremely uh, interesting and useful and important. Uh, thank you all for staying with us, and please join me in thanking our two panelists, Angus Blair and Justin Dargan. Thank you.